Did any of you notice what the scripture is? How many of you would like to volunteer to read the scripture this morning? I gave the pastor a hard time because I'm like, I asked the kids, will you read the scripture? What is the scripture? And if you say it's the entire book of Daniel 5, all of you are going to go. And you know what he said to me? I think he did this on purpose. But you did it so great the last time when you read the whole book of Daniel 2. All right, camera boys, I'm moving. I'm going to read you for Pastor Mark, the entire book of Daniel 5. Get out your Bible or your phone and follow along with me because I know that you will love to correct my pronunciation of half of the words in the chapter two. Chapter five of the book of Daniel. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of those thousands. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring what? Gold and silver vessels, which his father, who? Okay, I've got two. Come on now. We're going to take a long time to get through this if y'all don't answer my questions. Which his father had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then he brought the gold, oh, then they, excuse me, brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God in Jerusalem, and the kings and the lords and the wives and his concubines drank from them as they drank the wine and praised the lowercase gods. You got that? They praised lowercase gods, not uppercase, as they praised the gods of the gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. In the same hour, the what? The whole hand? Bible says a finger, the finger of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed. His thoughts troubled him so that even the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees did what? Knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. The king spoke saying to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads the writing and tells me Tells me what it means, its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the 50th ruler in the kingdom, third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but could anyone read the writing on the wall? None. Or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed, and the lords were astonished with him. The queen, even because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O oh, king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the capitalized, holy, capitalized God. Not lowercase, uppercase. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, lowercase, were found in him. And King, who? Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, made him chief of all the magicians, all the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and all the soothsayers. So inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this man. Who? I hear two again. Who was it found in? Daniel. All of these things were found in this man, Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will give the interpretation. So Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel who is the one of the captives from Judah, who my father, the king, brought from Judah? I have heard of you that the spirit of the capital God is in you 
and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now let the wise men, the astrologers, they have been brought before me that they would read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of this thing. But I've heard of you that you give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you will be clothed in purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and you will be the 50th ruler in the kingdom. Third, third ruler in the kingdom. I'm just making sure you're still with me. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to somebody else. But I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whoever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his earthly kingdom. His kingly throne, excuse me. They took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the capital letters most high God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. Although you knew everything that happened, you knew all this. You have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines, you have drunk wine from them and you have praised the lowercase gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from, capital him, sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription and what was written. Pronunciation. Many, many, tackle, zufarsin. There you go. This is the interpretation of each of the words. Many. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and you have been found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they did clothe Daniel in purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the 50th ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. it how many thought gina did a fabulous job i thought it was wonderful just like daniel 2 and i've got one more chapter i'd like to read all the way through daniel chapter 6 how many of you think gina should read daniel chapter 6 all right i think we've got somewhat of a majority here Let's see what we can do so good sabbath morning and almost afternoon sarah for those of you who walked in a little bit uh, 
uh, later after Sarah got up there, she said, good morning. And we, don't, we always say good morning, but we keep responding, right? So everybody changed it up a little bit, threw you some curveballs. So, but uh, it is a good day, isn't it? I felt a little tired, though. I was sitting there, I'm like, man, I feel a little tired. And I don't know why exactly, but uh, I do remember uh, growing up playing sports, and I played hockey. You know what it took for me to wake up when I was tired once in a while? I'd get ready for a game, and I'd be kind of tired. And finally, I got one big body check and ended up on the ice, and then I woke up after that. So maybe I need that. Owen, you want to come up here and wherever you are? I can't find you <clears throat> in the back. So, but anyways, uh, so good, but I love reading through the whole chapter. How about you? I don't know about you, but one word stood out to me right at the beginning that maybe I didn't focus on this week when I was reading through Daniel chapter five or the word tasted. I think it was in verse uh, two. It says uh, Belshazzar tasted the wine. And there was something about that wine that he tasted that satisfied him and it led him to a life of resisting God. You know, how many times have we heard this story before? And I don't know about you, maybe there was a word or a phrase or a thought that the Lord, I don't know, that spoke out to you this morning. Just by reading his word, we need to do it. And we read these stories and, and accounts and just things stand out. But the word tasted really stood out to me there. Uh, so I thought I'd mention that. But we are moving on in the book of Daniel, uh, the writing on the wall. It's a well-known well -known phrase. You guys heard that phrase before. Have you heard it outside of the Bible, might I say? I think we know where it comes from. It comes from the Bible, but it is a well-known phrase. As um, uh, Rembrandt, the famous artist, he put it in oil on canvas back in the 1600s. And maybe you've heard of Paul Simon, music artist, or Cardi B, I believe she's more modern, and Katy Perry. They all use this same phrase in their songs. I haven't listened to the songs, or maybe I've heard them somewhere. But um, you know, do they know where it came from? I think some of them do. I believe that Katy Perry, as I've heard, if you know who she is, she did grow up in a Christian home. And I actually looked at the lyrics real quick, and you read the lyrics, and it all essentially has spiritual um, you know, undertones to it. But I really wonder if she or if other of all of us, do we really honor the God fully you know, from where that phrase came from, the writing on the wall. So what does it mean for us today? might we ask? We use it in everyday speech. What does it mean? The writing on the wall. What does that mean? We generally mean that something bad is going to happen, right? We can see that something bad is going to happen, so we need to brace ourselves or prepare ourselves because it's com uh, because it's coming, because it's coming, or simply that we just, um, yeah, just in the near in the near future, right? We see the writing on the wall. Is it that simple as we read this story, or is there a little more to it? as we put it in context with the Bible. And as always, we put it in context with the Bible. There's, there's a lot more to it. So what can we learn from this account today? And one important point, again, of reading God's Word is that we need God's Word to speak to our hearts. We can talk about it. I can talk about it. I might be able to add a few thoughts here and there, but ultimately it comes down to God's Word is God's Word reaching into your heart because that's what brings transformation. So that needs to be our focus. So let's pray one more time and ask for the Lord to help us. Lord God, thank you so much for this Sabbath morning. It is a good morning. Lord, every morning is good when we have you in our life, and we pray that you would reveal yourself to us more fully here this morning and today on this good Sabbath day, and as we continue on the journey of faith. And uh, hey, we fall, we stumble, but Lord, help us to get back up and continue moving forward, and bless us as we Talk about Daniel chapter 5 and read your word here this morning. May you be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we picked up an owl. You can see the owl there on the deck. We tried to curb the inundation of birds that are all surround our deck, and they actually get into the dryer exhaust and the fireplace exhaust, if you know what I mean. It's a it's a mechanical fireplace there, electric fireplace. So they build their nest in there and they clog up the fireplace. Is actually, um, that was a little scary because I actually realized because the flame wasn't really burning. I'm like, what's going on? I went out there and I see all this stuff built up. And as I started to clean it, it was actually black. It was getting a little dark there. So you might want to go home and check your fireplace exhaust if you have one of those cheap electric dealers. I like the real thing. I don't know about you. I like the real fire, but it works when we're cold. So we thought we had a pretty good plan 
until we saw a robin perched on its head. You can see that robin there. That's not the actual one, but I need to get a new battery for this because it's not working so well. Can you see the robin right there? So we looked out the window. You thought he was there too. I'm like, look, it's not really working. He's making a mockery of the owl kingdom sitting on the owl's head. And since I was thinking about Daniel 5 all week, a little bit last week too, it made me think of Belshazzar actually, who mocked the God of heaven. Right? The God of heaven was not real to him. And a lot of it was by choice, which I appreciate the, the story there this morning. It was by choice, really, as we're going to see, because he actually knew things of God, and he got a little too confident thinking that God wasn't real until judgment fell on him. And hopefully that bird doesn't uh, land on a real owl's head or something bad could happen to him. So let's back up just a little bit. I always like doing a little quick review because it gets the train rolling a little bit. For those of you in the Daniel Revelation studies, you know I like to do that, and I think it's for me just as much as uh, hopefully it, you benefit from, from it as well. But Daniel chapter 1, captives, uh, and it was about determination. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, he besieged Jerusalem. He leveled it to the ground. And uh, it was God's chosen mode of judgment to work through Babylon to bring that up upon his people in order that they would wake up because they were sleeping to spiritual things. He looted the temple of God and brought various articles, including cups. Remember that from the story? What did uh, Belshazzar do with those cups? They partied with them. They drank from them. Brought those to Babylon. He took captives, of course, Daniel and his friends and others. Uh, and you remember, that came as a result of corporately rejecting the Lord. Even Daniel and his friends, who, from all accounts, we can tell they were faithful, they were part of that judgment, that corporate judgment, because as a whole... God's people said, no, they did not choose him. But there were a faithful few that were determined to stay allegiant to the God of heaven. We read about that in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 2 was about kingdoms, right? It's God's vision for the future because he declares the beginning from the end. God revealed, remember, this was a dream of Nebuchadnezzar. He revealed to the king who was not really a believer at that point. Maybe he was on the process as we know. But the Lord declared the kingdoms that would rise and fall from his day, from the kingdom of Babylon, which is a type of Satan's kingdom, all the way to the kingdom of God, which will be eternal in the end. Amen. Chapter 3 was all about worship okay, and worshiping the true God. And God stands with his people. Amen. You believe that? Does he stand with you in the fire? I don't know about you, but it doesn't always feel like he's there. Can you relate with that or am I the only one? I'm on way off. No, sometimes it feels like he's not there. Was he with Jesus when he was on the cross? Did Jesus tell that he was there? Did he feel that he was there? Did you believe God was there, though? I believe in the same way he was with us, even though we can't feel it, especially in the moment. But we believe that he is with us. And he is the one whom we worship. Chapter 4 was about King Nebuchadnezzar, who we read about. Right? He was humbled. Why? Because he became proud. And he was uh, essentially humbled until the Lord would lift him once again, once he recognized the king of kings. And he was sovereign over all because Nebuchadnezzar thought he was sovereign over all. So things got to his head. And now Daniel chapter 5, as we read the account there, it records the demise of King Belshazzar and the fall of the kingdom of Babylon. And for those of you who were here a few weeks ago, we did what looked at some archaeological evidence. We went through of the whole book of Daniel, but there were a couple specifically that spoke of King Belshazzar and the fall of Babylon. You had the Nabonidus cylinder and the Persian verse account of Nabonidus. They worked together. The Nabonidus cylinder affirms Belshazzar as the son. And then the Persian verse account affirms that Nabonidus' son, Belshazzar, had been entrusted with the kingship and was reigning when Babylon fell around 539 B.C. And these things were profound because before these were found, these inscriptions, these finds, they were found, there was no record of Belshazzar. So skeptics, what would they do? They would use that and say, oh, the Bible is not authentic, right? They would bring question into the validity and the authenticity of the Word of God. But then once these were found, does it prove the Bible? 
in a way, yes, it does. It more validates the Bible. I think archaeologists, biblical archaeologists will use because we believe the Bible is true. There's enough evidence already, but these help to validate even more in our minds that here is the word of God. And I think we went through a dozen of these finds all in the book of Daniel. So pretty awesome. And I love archaeology. And relating to our study today, there was the Nabonidus Chronicle and the Cyrus Cylinder. These confirmed the fall of Babylon to the Persians in 539 BC. And then Cyrus setting the captives free from Babylon to go back to the land and worship, which included the Jewish people as well. So a couple or just a few awesome finds in the last verse of Daniel 31, which we're not going to read again, but it says that, right, the Medes and the Persians took over after the fall of the kingdom of Babylon. All of it's there. So in Daniel chapter 5, what happened at the beginning? Belshazzar hosted what? A big party, a big feast. He decided to use the sacred things from God's temple, those cups, which his father, his great-grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had taken. And he brought them to Babylon, and this was before Nebuchadnezzar's conversion. But Belshazzar says, bring out those cups, right? And they did. But in the midst of their drinking and feasting, what happened? All of a sudden, this hand of the hand of God appeared on the wall and wrote an inscription on the wall. How would you respond if you saw that? Would it make the hair on the back of your neck stand up? I do admit uh, when I was a kid or younger, maybe a little bit older, I had the hair on, on my uh, arms or on my neck stand up playing a Parker Brothers game. You know what game that is? The Ouija board. It's a Parker's Brother game, right? And I don't know if it was whether true or not back then, but it sure made my hair stand up. Just the thought of it made my hair stand up. Verse 5 says, Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand, on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. So this is what the scriptures tell us. Belshazzar, Belshazzar and his cohorts, not thinking or seeing straight at the moment, probably because of all of their uh, wine drinking, drinking in the wine of Babylon. You know, once you taste the wine of Babylon, it's hard to break it. It is satisfying in a way for those of you who have been there before. It wouldn't be so satisfying if it wasn't at least pleasurable, but that's how Satan works. He appeals to our senses. He makes them so they seem pleasurable, but then you get too much. Some of you may know what happens after a bit. But they saw this hand on the wall, and how do you think they responded? Did they, keep their, did they continue their partying? partying? They kind of quickly sobered up for a second, and they all focused in when they saw the hand writing on the wall. The scriptures tell us then, in verse 6, Then the king's face grew pale, and the thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints were slack, and his knees began knocking together. And Gina, you did a fantastic job displaying that for us. That's why it's Daniel 6. I think you're in. But we'll see what we can do about that. So in desperation, what did he do? He called in the same kind of wise guys who failed King Nebuchadnezzar so many years before in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 4. He called his cabinet. They kept going back to the same dry well that would never produce what he was looking for. So the king's face grew even more pale as time progressed. That's when someone with experience stepped in. Here comes mom or the queen comes in, right? The queen, likely his mother or grandmother down the line. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your, of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. So what wisdom are we talking about here? This is the No, this is talking about the wisdom of God, because we're talking about Daniel here. Where did Daniel get his wisdom? He got it from God, and it was because of his faithfulness that the Lord increased that wisdom. They didn't recognize it as the wisdom of God, but we know that's where it came from. So they call it the wisdom of the gods. They were found in him, and King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your your father, the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. So even he was in Babylon, Daniel was, 
given high position, as we're going to see, all the way up to third in the kingdom. But an important point, although he was in Babylon, he still remained faithful to the Lord Most High. Amen? And we can do the same as well. My, my little red button's working, but not the clicker. This was because an extraordinary spirit, this is the spirit of God, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and the solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. So now Daniel was called in on the scene, right? The, the wise men couldn't do it. What was Daniel promised? If he could make the interpretation known, you got your hand up. 100%. Fantastic. He, he was promised essentially wealth and then also position. Third ruler in the kingdom. We understand and know that it's the third ruler in the kingdom because, um, because of his father, Nabonidus. Again, those archaeological finds confirm that Belshazzar was standing in place of his father, who was off on some type of adventure. You know, da da da. So that's why third ruler in the kingdom. So we see how archaeology validates the biblical narrative. But what did Daniel say to those gifts, young lady? What did Daniel say? Did he take those? Keep them for yourself. I don't want your gifts. Good answer. He says, I don't need your gifts. Give them to somebody else, right? And then Daniel said, O king, the most high God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father, because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language, language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed. And whomever he wished, he spared alive. And whomever he wished, he elevated. And whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up, like whom? Whose else heart was lifted up in the Bible? Maybe the foundation of all of it. Satan is one I'm thinking of. You could probably think of some others, but Satan, his heart was lifted up. He is a type of Satan. And his spirit became so proud. Who else was, who else was proud in the Bible that led to his fall? Lucifer, once again, that he behaved arrogantly. He was deposed from his royal throne. Who else was deposed from his royal throne? Lucifer, again, he was a covering cherub by the throne of God. Cast out. His glory was taken away from him. Verse 21, he was also driven away from mankind and his heart was made like that of the beasts and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. I love that word, until. Right, when does salvation come to us? Not until we recognize the Lord Most High ourselves and give our lives to Him. That's when salvation well, is provided for us as a free gift. But once we apply that, it's, a, it's when we recognize the Lord Most High. Verse 22, and this is, this is a profound statement. Maybe if you got anything this morning, maybe this is a bit of the emphasis. starts off with, yet you. Another way of saying, but. I love that word in the Bible, this transition. He says, yet you, his son, okay, speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, even if it is his grandson or great-grandson, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all of this. I don't know, that just stuck out to me so much when I was reading this text. He knew, even though he knew everything about Nebuchadnezzar in the past, and he likely knew about Daniel as well. You know, truth was presented to him. He had the opportunity, but he resisted it. He made the choice to say no. He brushed it to the side, put it on the back burner. It was even willful ignorance. Somebody said that this morning, or maybe that was Sabbath school. I can't remember, but it was more of like willful ignorance. And a handful of scriptures came to mind relating to this thought of knowing the fact that Belshazzar knew all of this, I think of Romans chapter 1. I know Tucker has been going through Romans. And, uh, but after writing about the power of the gospel that leads both Jews and Gentiles to salvation and having the righteous, righteousness of God revealed in them, he speaks about the unrighteous. And he says here, he says, 
for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. So God's wrath comes in response to sin and ungodliness. Okay, it's not arbitrary. It says, and, and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. The truth is suppressed. And of course, we know Satan and his angels are at the heart of that as they work through the unrighteous. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Can we see that God, there is divine uh, creation, right? We can see and we understand that it's made by the hand of God and everybody can see it, but it is denied. And then verse, uh, as it continues, it says, for even though, in verse 21 through 23, for even though they knew God, like Belshazzar, even though they knew, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Right? Once you reject the light, there's darkness. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling uh, creatures. All right, so this seems to be characteristic of mankind, right? We're all part of mankind. We're all fallen. We all have a, a fallen nature. We can understand that. And even though we have truth plainly before us, we often fail to acknowledge it and follow it to the fullest extent. Would you agree with that? We're all guilty. By nature, the broad path is easier. Jesus tells us that, right? Why it is the way that leads to destruction. But the path that leads to, to righteousness and life is, is narrow. It's hard to stay on. You ever see those uh, videos, or maybe you've experienced it, if you walk on a balance beam, if it's close to the ground, no problem, right? But you start getting that up in the air, and all of a sudden, you can't walk on that. The narrow path is hard to follow, right? So I also came across this week the, um, about the sons of the faithful prophet Samuel. I read a couple of texts there, right? Who also, Samuel had a faithful mother. You remember Hannah that raised him, committed him to the Lord? So Samuel's sons had that example, those examples. And I read this text here, verse 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 3, and it came about... When Samuel was old, that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his first one was Joel. The name of the second was Abijah. They were judging in Beersheba. His sons, is that word? However, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. So just another text that was just so profound to me. I'm like, how can that be? All right, so it took me back really to think about that. You know, this may run over well for political office today, you know, but not with the kingdom of God. You know, Samuel's sons chose a different path, even though they had Samuel as their father. They had Hannah as a grandmother. These awesome examples. Why did they fail? Why did they not make the choice? I mean, we can't really answer that. So much, but nobody is a shoe in for the kingdom. It is a narrow path. And maybe you've heard, and I've heard many stories of even not that pastors or evangelists are better than anybody else, but okay, they're maybe they're, you know, at least the ones that I've known are committed to the Lord and then their children. You know, not all of them, but I've heard stories of many of them that, you know, are not part of the church so much. So how can that be? It just doesn't make sense in my mind. And, you know, Claudia grew up in the church. She came from a different background than me. And, and um, as far as I know, and still know today, her parents are both faithful to the church and very active in the church. And, and, um, but Claudia saw a Facebook post that really stuck out to me a little while ago. You told me about this, if you remember what I'm saying, but if I remember it correctly, essentially says, you know you're a pastor's kid 
when you've heard Daniel 8 explained 20,000 times and you still don't understand it. And it's kind of funny, but then it's kind of sad. Once you actually start thinking about it, this smile kind of disappears because I laughed at first too, and I'm like, that's actually sad. Not understanding the word of God once you start thinking about it. But it takes time. It takes commitment. Everybody can understand this, but it does take time and commitment, and we need that same spirit that God gave um, Daniel. Maybe that's why this whoever this was who wrote that couldn't understand it because they didn't commit themselves to the Lord. So, you know, the draw from Babylon, it overtakes the majority. I think we can understand that. And Babylon, keep in mind, when we use this word Babylon today, it's speaking of a, okay, we're referencing back to literal ancient Babylon, but Babylon today is both a literal global system, right, religious, political, economic, okay, it's counter to the, to the kingdom of God. When we use this term Babylon, it stands in opposition to the kingdom of God, okay, and it takes people captive. That's essentially what it means. But it's also a spiritual concept as well. At least this is how I understand it when we say Babylon and its draw to everybody. You know, it's spiritual as well. And anything part of the kingdom of Satan that draws people away from God. This is all what I mean when I say Babylon there. So as we continue on, Belshazzar, like those in Romans 1, as we read, Samuel's sons. Instead of acknowledging and submitting to the Lord, they chose a different path. So that's really what stood out to me so much this week, and I kept running through my mind. So instead of submitting to God, I'm thinking of James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, instead of submitting God, who did they submit to? They submitted to the devil. Instead of resisting the devil, they resisted God. Instead of drawing near to God, as James says, they drew near to evil. And maybe that was easier. It's the more comfortable path, one that the world would prove of. You know, of course, the, the, anytime you do something, you know, well, and the world likes it, they're going to give you approval, even though it might be countering God's will. And maybe you can think of examples. Continues in verse 23, it says, but, speaking of Belshazzar, right, didn't acknowledge God, but you have exalted yourself. Even though he knew about Nebuchadnezzar, he knew the past. You have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see hear or understand, but the God in whose hand are your life breath and all your ways you have not glorified. You have not uh, glorified. So he did learn something from Nebuchadnezzar. He learned to exalt himself like Nebuchadnezzar did before his conversion, but taking it even a step further, making a mockery of God and using the vessels, the things of God, right? And that's when we get to verse 24, it says, then... This is after, this is Daniel continuing. He says, then the hand was sent up from him and this inscription was written out. Now this is the inscription that was written out. Many, many tekel you farsen. That is the interpretation of the message. Or this is the interpretation of the message. Many, God has numbered your kingdom and put it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient or found wanting. Perez, which is the plural form, or Eupharsin is the plural form, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. So it was on that very night that Belshazzar and Babylon fell. And again, back to our archaeological evidence. Remember, we read about Herodotus even speaks to this fall as well and how it happened so it's interesting to note also keeping in mind remember there's always a story behind the story that when we talk about babylon in the book of revelation it also falls quickly judgment comes it comes in one hour even just like it did here in the book of daniel chapter five and that's when the kings from the east were going to come it says in the book of revelation chapter 16 
in the same way as I've mentioned, the kings of the Medes and the Persians come from the east, right? And they're the ones who ultimately redeem God's people. Can you see that picture of Christ? Right? He will come and redeem his people from Babylon, set them free from their captivity. Amen? And that's speaking more of the second coming of Christ. But once we come to believe, we are set free, aren't we? Right? From the sin and from the penalty, from the wage of sin, which is death, as we learned in our scripture reading. So the writing on the wall, okay, aside from the demise of Belshazzar and the fall of Babylon, what else can we learn? Or how can we just understand that, just to kind of summarize this? The first, maybe the main point here is Belshazzar could not read the writing on the wall. I think it's an important point. He couldn't read the writing on the wall. Normally when we say we see the writing on the wall, we know in essence what it means, right? But Belshazzar could not read the writing on the wall. Maybe it's like somebody has an old van. You know what I'm talking about? It has some issues and it starts costing a little money and you have to bring it where Josh works. And um, the wife is giving you a hard time for having it in the first place. So you kind of know the end is coming. So I submitted and the writing was on the wall and uh, we have it no more, fortunately. I know Jackson likes it. We've got at least one fan out there. So, but Belshazzar and those who were with him in Babylon, right, they could not read the writing on the wall. They needed help from somebody with the extraordinary spirit, being the spirit of God, to interpret it. So I heard a devotional the other day, and I really speak, I think it's, it spoke to this. I definitely, uh, maybe just because Daniel 5 was on my head, I, I immediately thought about this. It's in John chapter 14, when Jesus is, uh, he's given the promise of his spirit. To his disciples. It starts in verse 14, no, chapter 14, verse 16. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Who is the helper? That is the Spirit, and he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth. How many of you want that? I mean, we need it. If we say we don't want it, obviously that's a rhetorical question. We need it. We need to want it. If we don't want it, then we need to pray that we want it. And I pray that sometimes. I don't know about you. Give me the desire. Give me the motivation. You know, I pray for that. So he says, that is the spirit of truth. And notice this next one. Whom the world cannot receive. That isn't won't receive or refuses to see. The Bible says they cannot see. So why can't the world receive the spirit of truth? It says in the next verse, next part, it says, because it does not see him or know him. You can't receive what you don't see or know, or you're blind, or you're in the dark. When you're in Babylon, in full or in part, right, blinded by the lusts of the world or the pursuits of the world, or the pride of life, unwilling to humble ourselves before the Lord, in a way we are blinded to truth, aren't we? Maybe why, you know, I had that thought there, I said it earlier, but maybe that's why that person wrote that post about Daniel chapter 8. Okay, they did whatever, maybe they were, they're in a way that they were blinded. Maybe it was by choice. I guess it's always by choice. Um, so I thought about this text as well, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 and 4, as we're, we're coming to a close here. It says, and even if our gospel is veiled, Paul speaking to the Corinthians about receiving the gospel, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Right? They cannot see, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And and uh, no, we're talking about the world. 100% we can apply this to ourselves. Amen? I think it's one point. We're blinded in one way or another. We don't have all knowledge. That's definitely the path that we're supposed to be on. I believe that's what God wants to give all of us, to show us all light. But in a ways, we are blinded ourselves. And maybe it's because of our pursuits or our attitude, whatever it might be. Um, but another thought on that also is that when we're preaching the gospel, because that's our commission, right? Okay, we're, whether we're preaching to our church or going out to the world, people are blinded. 
And maybe we need to kind of keep that in mind as we're trying to get people, our family members, our friends, we're trying to get them to accept Christ, but in a way they're blinded. So we can't be hard on them, but we need to look at ourselves first because I'm blinded too. To say that we are so seeing, I think is a wrong position, but recognizing we're just the same. We are a child of God, even though with somebody who doesn't believe at all, they're still technically a child of God, amen? God loves them just as much as he loves us, and he's trying to get them in the kingdom. So it's just maybe just a thought as we, our job is to preach the gospel, recognizing that we're blind and we're preaching to people who are blind. That's why we need the spirit of God. And it's only with the spirit of God that we um, can understand. And that's the promise Jesus gives, but you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. And this is the only way that we can understand and we can know truth and see light and come out of, of darkness. And this comes with through time and through experience, amen? Walking with God, walking the walk, seeking after them. And even when things, you, you can't see things very clearly and you're not feeling God in the moment, that's when we keep pressing on, Paul says. You keep pressing on on the journey. We move in faith because we believe God at his word, amen? Just as Jesus kept on in faith when he, even, even when he was on the cross, when he couldn't see. It's by faith. So number one, Belshazzar could not read the writing on the wall. It was because he was disconnected from God and he chose to do his own thing separate from the will of God, even though it was there for him. And the second obvious point, the writing came as a consequence of re rejecting the Lord. Okay, the writing of the wall came as a consequence of rejecting the Lord, even though he knew it. And finally, Daniel had a clear message from God to those who willingly rejected him. Can we see that? He had a clear message. He lived it for one, amen, by example, but then he preached it as well. And Babylon's days have been numbered. That was part of Daniel's message. Even today, is that not the message today? As we're nearing the end of time, Babylon's days are numbered just the same. It has been weighed and measured, judged, and found wanting according to the world. Satan's kingdom will be overtaken by Cyrus, Jesus, the king of kings. And we all need to some degree, we need to come out of Babylon. Amen? I think we all need to recognize that or at least take a look at our own lives. And um, Babylon in the spirit of Babylon, and we need to separate. And that's part of our message, our gospel, and maybe our special message as we've been studying in Sabbath school, the three angels' message. messages. Number two is to, right, Babylon is fallen, okay, and to come out of her. Uh, last thought, I was went for a little bike ride the other day, go to Sailorville, and I came across, I go to this about a half hour out, and there's this little uh, area where I stretch and whatever, do a couple things. This couple came up and, um, you know, said hi to them and talked to them just for a moment, and I saw that guy's shirt, and it said, choose joy, you know, so I, I say, hey, I like your shirt, choose joy, and we started talking, and I'm like, I choose it. I think I said something like that, and we started talking, and, and uh Eventually, through our conversation, you know, I said, well, I take it you're believers then, you know, and they said, yeah, yeah, this is actually a Christian radio station. I figured it was, or I, once we started talking about it, but, you know, they brought it out. I don't want all of a sudden, you know, you don't want to overwhelm somebody, and you're always looking for that end to talk about spiritual things, but in a way, they kind of brought it up, and, um, um, but again, thinking about Daniel chapter five, it was about choice. Choose joy. Are you choosing joy? Or are you choosing, right, the wine of Babylon, which when Belshazzar tasted it, it satisfied him. So I pray that the Lord is your satisfaction and not that which is in the world. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this, this time this morning, your word. There's so much there, and we just made a few points. Lord, and we know Babylon is going to fall. Lord, it's, the writing is on the wall, and maybe the writing is on the wall for America as well. As I didn't even get into that. As we know, our, our country in many ways is turning away from you. So, Lord, uh, we appeal to you to help us to get out of Babylon to whatever degree we are in it. And we are participating in practice or in spirit, whatever separating us from you. Lord, help us to see it, 
And we know we need your spirit in order to see it in the first place. So please pour out your spirit on us by your grace and your mercy and help us not to resist the evidence that you have presented in our lives in the past from our family, from our friends, from your word, and help us to choose to follow you in the name of Jesus. Amen.